great, we're going to read God's word. So if you'll stand, it's a real short scripture. <laughs> it's 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 through 18. Always rejoice, constantly pray, and everything give thanks. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. The word of God for the people of God. And the people of God said, thanks be to God. Thank you. Okay, I'm starting off, off a script here this morning. Get, I'm a scripter, so this is my unscripted part. So a couple weeks ago was a really terrible week. Like, it just was a hard parenting week. I love you children, but it just was particularly hard. And some things had happened. And so here's what happened. Is at the end of the week on that Sunday was our new cub potluck dinner. And some of you got to come. If you didn't, don't miss it next year. You don't want to. And I just want to tell you, I am so thankful for my church family. It was such a fun time. It like pulled me right out of the funk. That morning in service helped too. Don't get me wrong. The news about Jesus was so good and hope was so good. But I can't tell you, and it's not just lip service, how deeply grateful I am for all of you. I love being a part of this church. I love being a part of this family. I always tell my kids, this is our family. This is our new Cuff family. And so I hope you feel that love. I hope you know how deeply grateful that I am for you, that our staff is for you. Um, and so I just wanted to start with that. I'm so thankful for all of you. Um, I love Thanksgiving. Like, it almost ties for Christmas for me. Don't strike me down, please. I love it so much. I love it because every year we go to my aunt and uncle's old farmhouse in Cherokee, Oklahoma. Raise your hand if you know where Cherokee, Oklahoma is. Okay, more of you than I imagined. It's a teensy town up in northwestern Oklahoma, kind of by Alva, the Panhandle. Um, and so all 50 plus of us gather in this farmhouse. I mean, I think this year my aunt counted 32 adults and 28 kids or something insane like that and I'm not telling they're not living in a mansion y'all this is like a two bathroom house so we have to take turns using the bathroom too um but we crowd in we set hodgepodge all over that place with folding chairs and card tables K kids are in the basement like it's I mean it's so fun it is a thing um but every year we go there and then we eat lunch we leave the food out all afternoon which my sister-in-law who's a food person would be like do not do that but we do it <laughs> and then we fill our plates for dinner before we leave and make the trek back to Oklahoma City um but most afternoons in most afternoons of Thanksgiving my dad he left me this year we'll talk about it later I already had a talk with him my dad will say let's go take a drive and it'll just be my mom and dad and me and my sister and brother kind of the original five and we'll get in the car and we'll drive all, all over the streets of this little town and remember all the memories there. We go by the church. My papa pastored that church for some time. My parents are married there. I'm pretty sure I was baptized there, right? Surely. Yes, my mom's nodding yes. Um, our old houses, this one house I remember where the middle of the night or late at night, there was a tornado warning pouring down rain. We had to run next door to the cellar of the neighbors outside. The house that was freezing cold and only had a space heater in the living room, and so we'd sleep in the living room when it was really cold. My mom will probably be embarrassed that I told you that, but we drive by that house. Um, we drive by the elementary school where I attended kindergarten, and my teacher was Miss Rathgeber, which you don't really forget a name like that, Miss Rathgeber. And then the bank my mom worked at, the house my grandparents lived in, the field I would walk across to go to preschool so many memories and I'm so thankful I'm thankful to drive those streets and be reminded of stories of life long ago I'm thankful to remember loved ones that are gone but will live on forever this is where I get sad this is our first Thanksgiving without our grandparents so that was weird and it was hard but it was still good and I'm still thankful I'm thankful for the new memories that we make every year um, coming to that place, and it's not lost on me that someday it might be a new place. When we were driving up, my kids were like, Mom, are we going to go to Thanksgiving here forever? And I was like, well, <laughs> there will actually come a day when you probably won't, but um, we won't talk about that day yet. So it, it's our life. That's our, that's our memories. The very short scripture that we read today is from First Thessalonians, and Paul is writing to the church in Thessalonica. 
Timothy, who was Paul's son in the faith and was mentored by him, had been in Thessalonica, and he'd rejoined Paul and had given him this great news about the church there. And the great news was that the Thessalonians were standing firm and exhibiting the virtues of genuine Christianity, faith, love, and steadfastness. So in the verse that we looked at today, these three encouragements are given to the Thessalonians from Paul. He says, he says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing is my version that I use, sorry, and give thanks in all circumstances for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So I want to just walk through each of these characteristics today. As characteristic traits of believers, these encouragements are given to us and how we should, they should mark our lives at all times and in every situation. That's God's will. So the first one, rejoice always. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. So they already had joy in suffering, but they are called to a life of joy that is constant. Rejoice always. Philippians 4, 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. You remember that song? Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. <laughs> rejoice in the Lord. So how do we rejoice always? What does that mean? The world's definition of joy is a feeling of great pleasure and happiness. I don't know about you all, but I do not know how I can rejoice always with that being the definition. I'm always happy, or I'm not <laughs> I'm not always happy. Ask my kids is what I'm trying to tell you. This world is difficult, and it's filled with grief and sadness and brokenness, and you know this. This is part of life. So I kept digging. I came across this definition from the Bible Project podcast, and I thought it was perfect. Joy is an attitude God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and promise. It's on the screen, and I'm going to say it for you again. Joy is an attitude God's people adopt, not because of happy circumstances, but because of their hope in God's love and promise. Therefore, I can rejoice because my joy is found in the truth that I am deeply loved by God. And guess what? So are each one of you. You are a child of God, his chosen. Um, Henry Nowen wrote a book that Pastor Jay has referenced before called Life of the Beloved, which I read it too. It's a great book. You should all read it. It's teensy. In it, he says this about being chosen. I want you to really hear this because I think it's so sweet. If I could like walk up to you and hold your little face in my hand, I would do it because this is how precious this is to me. From all eternity... Long before you were born and became a part of history, you existed in God's heart. Long before your parents admired you or your friends acknowledged your gifts or your teachers, colleagues, and employers encouraged you, you were already chosen. The eyes of love had seen you as precious, as of infinite beauty, and as of eternal value. You are so loved by God. And in God's word, he promises, promises us all kinds of things. Like he created us and he knows us, even the number of hairs on our head. And I know some of you don't have a lot, so that doesn't feel as good. But for those of us that have a lot, it's a big deal. That is Psalm 139. He gives us rest, Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He gives us eternal life, John three sixteen. He forgives us when we confess to him. 1 John 1, 9. These promises are true. They're true. Therefore, we can rejoice always. The second thing that Paul said was pray without ceasing. Pray always, consistently and without fail. Colossians 4, 2 says, Continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful in it with, thanks, with thanksgiving. A misconception of prayer today, I think, is that people think of it as a system of exchange. You do this for me, and I'll do this for you. Or we're like, it's like God is a genie in a bottle, right? 
Our prayer should begin with the assumption that God, our Father, he's disposed to hear and he answers them. So how do we pray consistently and without fail today? And I think a big part is we make it part of our daily rhythm. Just like we brush our teeth and put on our clothes. Um, maybe it's right before you wake, before your feet hit the floor. Maybe it's while you brush your teeth. <laughs> Maybe it's on the drive to work. Turn the music off. How often are we ever really in silence? I am never, unless I'm in my car alone, <laughs> in really silent, silent places. So turn the music off and, and pray. Maybe um, from a mom perspective, when you get any minute to yourself at all, maybe you go hide in your closet. I've done that before too. Or even before you doze off to sleep. He just wants to hear from you. And it doesn't just have to be your words. Sometimes I feel like we don't really know what to say. It can be the Lord's Prayer. It can be Scripture. Um, or it could be prayer liturgy. Just talk to him. Pete Gregg is the founder of the 24-7 prayer movement. He's written books on prayer. He speaks on prayer. And he lives a life of praying always. He says the best advice he's ever been given about how to pray was this. Are you ready? It's just it's just groundbreaking. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. Keep it simple. Keep it real. And keep it up. Okay? Keep it simple. Keep it real. And keep it up. So that is how you can pray. There's this song called Talking to Jesus that Brandon Lake sings about hearing his grandma praying before bed every night. And then his mom drags him to church on Sunday morning and Wednesday nights. And then how he talks to Jesus and his son hears him and he begins talking to Jesus. So I go into my kids' room, most of my kids' rooms, every night and I pray with them. I just recently started asking them if they wanted to pray. And they did. They do. It was shocking. <laughs> and it's even sweeter because they'll pray the same prayers that I've been praying over them. So they'll ask for sweet dreams and no bad or scary dreams. They'll ask for healing of those who are sick, and most of them actually know the Lord's Prayer too, which is pretty cool. Um, so just talk to him. Just talk to the Lord. He wants to hear your voice and be in relationship with you. And lastly, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This call is first and foremost not to give thanks for every situation, but rather in every situation. I remember in high school, we would have this free lunch for people in our community that needed a meal. And so we'd have lunch and then we'd sing some hymns and have a short devotion. And there was this sweet lady that I can still see in my mind today. And she just hold up her hands and just worshiped God during that time. And I was so surprised and moved. I was in high school, remember? <laughs> to see someone that had so very little by the world's standards being so thankful in her worship to Jesus. Now that I'm older and I've seen more in my life, that doesn't surprise me at all. I've seen it in the orphanage in Guatemala where kids sing and shout and jump and worship out of thankfulness, and they don't have much at all. I've seen it at funerals when families share beautiful testimony of how thankful they were for a life well-lived and given to all around. I see it in my friend, and she's fighting with cancer, and it's not being kind to her at all. And yet every single time I hear from her, she ends her text with, God is good, with an explanation point. I had to go to the ER and get fluid off my lungs, but God is good, exclamation point. These people have learned to give thanks in all circumstances. Because being grateful isn't about this stuff. It's about something so much more. It's about the source of our joy and gratitude, which is Jesus Christ. So I want to close with this story that I read last week. Um, I follow a writer and a speaker. Her name is Ann Boskamp. She's very poetic in her writing, <laughs> if you know her. But she wrote about a story that she had read on her weekly email. And I just wanted to share it. Let me get my notes. I'm sorry. 
Okay, a man drove down a stretch of highway past this tattered cardboard sign that read, Honk if you're happy. And who doesn't roll his eyes at such a thought? As if the world is this strange hybrid of Pollyanna and Sesame Street. If you're happy and you know it, honk, honk. When it's really just a strange old world, it's broken and it's a mess, aching in the dark. But there's this one day, he drives past the sign with his little girl, and on a whim, he honks the horn. And every day when he passes the sign, of course his daughter begs him to do it again. And pretty soon, every time he's on the stretch of highway, this jaded, cynical man is anticipating that sign. If on a scale of 1 to 10, he's still an emotional 2, when he honked his horn, his happiness grew several points. So in time, he noticed that when he drove down this stretch of highway, it became a place of emotional rejuvenation for him. This man decides he's got to find out why this sign even exists. So one day, he's real brave, and he stops at the house by the sign on the highway, and he asks. The man who opens the door tells him, yes, he made the sign. He did it because every day he was sitting in his house in the darkened bedroom of his young wife who was dying. Then one day he really couldn't take it anymore. So he painted the sign and he stuck it out by the road. He said he did it because he didn't want people in their cars to take this moment for granted. This special, never again to be repeated moment with the ones they care for the most should be savored and they should be aware of the happiness in the moment. At first when he put up the sign, there was only a honk here or there, and his dying wife asked what that was about. And the husband explained how he'd put the sign out there. After a few more days, there was more honking and more, and the husband said that that honking became like medicine to her. As she lay there, she heard the horns, and found great comfort in knowing she wasn't isolated in a dark room dying. She was part of the happiness of the world. It was all around her. The medicine we can give our souls in the darkest nights is to find ways to give thanks for every glimmer, glimmer of light. Do you realize that having a spirit of gratitude can bring light into the world? Do you realize that you are the light of the world? Jesus says so in Matthew 5, 14 through 16. Hear this. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they can see your good works and give thanks to your Father who is in heaven. This world needs your light, reflecting out of your gratitude for God. It needs your honk if you're happy. It needs your listening ear. It needs your generous gift of time to someone who's lonely. It needs your eyes to see those unseen in our society. It needs that handwritten thank you of encouragement. This world needs your light the reflection of your gratitude for God. We give thanks to God, not because of how we feel, but because of who he is. Not because of how we feel, but because of who he is. And who is he? I'll remind you. <laughs> He's the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. He's the creator of the universe and of you and me. He's the Lord God Almighty who came as a baby, born in a stinky manger, and he grew to be a man. He is Jesus Christ, the Word made flesh who moved into the neighborhood. He loved and served and healed and discipled. He was then put to death on a cross full of shame for you and for me. But on the third day, he defeated death, and he gave the Holy Spirit to all who would call him Lord. And that same Spirit lives inside of me and each one of you. And so, we give thanks, not because of how we feel, but because of who he is. Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Will you pray with me? 
precious Father, we give you thanks. We give you thanks for this day, for the breath in our lungs, for another minute to live and love those around us. We rejoice fully and freely in this life, knowing we are deeply loved by you, chosen and beloved. We thank you for all of your promises. We thank you for being our Father, Savior, and friend. We love you, Lord. We give our lives to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.